I'd just like to take a moment to uh, thank each of you for your consistency and your coming to the class. I appreciate that so much. It's difficult to teach without a class, but you, uh, you've been a wonderful class. And appreciate all of you coming. I know some of you have told me you will not be able to be here next week, which will be our last one, until we start again later on. But uh, we're so glad that you came to be with us in this session. We studied the Psalms. Some of you have said you've enjoyed that very much that you have not found uh, other opportunities to study the Psalms very much. Most of the time we read them uh, in public worship or at home. You hear them read at funerals, other occasions, but to really get into them and study them, we've not done that very much over the years. It's been my observation at least. And uh, so we're glad we've had this opportunity. Grateful that you're with us today. Somebody uh, gave me this story some time ago. I don't, I don't think I used it here in this class. A preacher was going down the road one night and saw a dead mule in the road. So he called the authorities, called the police. We've got a former policeman here. <laughs> he told who he was and what he did, and he said, I thought you might like to know that there's a dead mule down here in the road. The policeman was a little bit smart and said, well, I thought you preachers were supposed to take care of the dead. <laughs> the preacher being, you know, equal to the occasion said, well, we do, but the first thing we do is call the next of kin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's good to have a chuckle in the day, isn't it? All right, we're going to sing our song. Thank you, Elijah, for the, being with us each time and singing for us. We appreciate that. And uh, then we'll have a prayer. Randy's going to lead us, lead us in our prayer. We're going to sing Faith of Our Fathers. Clarence and I talked about it earlier today, decided this would go well with our study for today. We're going to sing all three verses of this song. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon fire and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers. Holy 
everybody that's here that's taking their time to come out this afternoon to participate in the class. While we have those meetings that are sick, that are of our number, that even some of the class should be here that are under the weather or in some sort of ailment, Father, we pray for all of those that you'll give to them whatever level of health that is that, that you are willing for them to have. Father, our will will be that they will return and that your will be done. Father, just be with us as we go through the class and we can study and understand, gain knowledge. Be with us in what we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. When we study the Psalms, we are impressed by all the many themes that are covered in the Psalms, 150 of them. And just think of all the topics that we have studied about and the many, many themes they cover. All the emotions that we've seen in the Psalms. And all of the wonderful thoughts that come from them. You know, it's sort of like our songs. Someone said, let me, let me read or sing the songs of a nation and I care not who writes their laws. There's something about the songs of America that have impressed us. Songs. You have country songs. You have songs about love. You have songs about heartbreak. All the emotions are found in songs. And our great hymns, like the one we've just sung, Faith of Our Fathers. And in this particular song we're going to study today, there is a looking back upon history. Those who lived before and uh, all of the blunders, mistakes, sins they committed with a lesson for the generation of the time and future generations. So I want us to look into this. I found uh, that there have been various times in the Bible when God inspired his prophets or psalmists or apostles in the New Testament to reach back in history and to summarize God's dealings with his people. Uh, I find that often. In fact, in the book of Acts, two or three times in Paul's sermons, he summarized Old Testament history. It's very important for us to look at history. I don't know whether when you were in school you enjoyed history or not. Some people did, some people didn't. You thought you think of all those dates you were to remember. You say, I can't see how that was going to help me in life. But history can help us in life. History calls upon us to remember. History calls upon us to learn to learn from the mistakes and to be inspired by the good things. So the emphasis in this particular psalm that we're going to study today, which is, by the way, the second longest psalm. The longest is which chapter? Which one? 119. 119, right. 119 has 176 verses. This one has, I believe, 72 and so uh, they're the longest songs. The emphasis in this particular one is upon God's faithfulness to his people and their unfaithfulness to him. That pretty well summarizes how his people that he loved so much, he called them Abraham's seed, then through his providence made them a great nation. They grew down there in Egypt at a place called Gothen and uh, or Goshen and they grew at an alarming rate and they cried out to God under great and heavy burdens God heard their cries remembered his promise not as if God had forgotten <coughs> sometimes the Bible says God remembered but that does not mean that God in his infinite and his great wisdom for God it just simply mean that he called to mind what his promise was. What his promise was. And so 
No doubt these flashbacks were designed to teach and to inspire the present and future generations to be diligent in their obedience to God in order to avoid the consequences in departing from God in his work. Those consequences that happen to God's covenant people Israel. Uh, there's no theme greater, by the way, than the importance of faithfulness to God. Being faithful to God. True to God. As reflected in our respect and love for his word. I believe that our attitude toward the word reflects our attitude toward the author of that word, that is toward God. I think we need to exalt the word of God in our hearts. To do so is to exalt God because the word is the manner or the, the avenue by which he reveals himself. So we need to keep in touch with that word. So, the first generation, uh, let me give you just a little bit of uh, introduction here. The first generation that came out of Egypt did not remain true to God and rebelled against him. And God said, by the way, in the first chapter of Deuteronomy, that that generation will not see the good land that I have promised to Abraham's seed, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, except there were two that would. Who were they? Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. That's right. Joshua and Caleb. And those of you that are acquainted with the Old Testament history about this, remember that when they came to Kadesh Barnea in their journey toward that promised land, they were almost in sight of the land. And God said to Moses, you select one out of each of the tribes to go over as a spy team over into the land and to tell us something about the land. What about the cities? Are they fortified? Are they walled cities and all of that? Well, they went over and 10 of the spies came back and they said, well, it's a good land. They had evidence, you know, that they brought back the grapes and all of that land flowing with milk and honey is how God described it. But they said, we cannot take it. Why? Giants. Giants. The giants in the land. We're like what in their sight? Grasshoppers. And Joshua and Caleb stood up before the people, tried to calm the people because their fears were aroused. Fear, you know, keeps us from accomplishing what we need to accomplish. The opposite of fear is what? <coughs> What's another word that begins with an F? Faith. That's it. The opposite of fear is faith. Caleb and Joshua expressed their faith. They said, we're well able to do it with God. And uh, so they were given the opportunity to see that new land. Now, the second generation, the first generation died in the wilderness, right? Their fathers died in the wilderness. Now, the group that came out of the land who were adults above the age of 20 died in that experience in the wilderness. Their carcasses remain, and their children now have grown up. If they were babes, you know, they're now around 40 years of age. And they're, they're there in sight almost of the land just before going over at the land of Moab. And we have Moses' great speeches. Moses inspired that second generation in the words of the book of Deuteronomy. And we have those recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. Duet, the first part of Deuteronomy. Duet means two. The second giving of the law. The law given to the first generation, they failed. Now it's repeated. It's not another law. It's the same law of God given at Sinai. But it's given to the second generation. And uh, so they are privileged to go over. And I love the book of Deuteronomy because it stresses, <coughs> do not forget 
always remember, keep the Word of God as Moses inspired this next generation. Now, speaking of obedience and the importance of our obedience, the Bible from beginning to end emphasizes that. Time and time in the Old Testament, God reminded his people to be obedient to his word. In the New Testament, time and time again, we're reminded of those Old Testament examples of Israel who did not respect God's will and disobeyed him, rebelled against him. I'll give you just a few references. 1 Corinthians 10, 5 through 11. And Paul said as he was speaking to the church at Corinth, all of these things are our examples of what things. He had mentioned in that context what happened to Old Testament Israel. Now all of these things are given to us for examples to inspire us to do better, to teach us. Romans 15, 4 says the things written aforetime, that's in the Old Testament, were written for our learning so we can learn from this. We can learn from all of these examples. Now let me give you a similar uh, warning in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was addressed to Christian Jews who were scattered outside of Palestine and they were urged to give ear, that is take heed, take the more earnest heed to things we've heard lest we become dull of hearing. So we need to listen to what God has said and how important that is. And we're going to take a look at sacred history this afternoon. So the author's psalm here is connected again with Asaph. Anybody know who Asaph was? He's a musical director. All right. <laughs> okay. He was second. He was the second. In command. Okay. He was an assistant to David, wasn't he? Going back to the book of Chronicles, it gives us a little bit of background about this fellow, Asaph. As I said, this is the second largest, longest psalm. And both of these, Psalm 119 and this one, uh, presents some very important things about the Word of God. Psalm 119 teaches us that we are to follow that word that is called law, ways, precepts, testimonies, judgments, statutes, commandments, and word. All of those designate the word of God. So it's the first and most detailed in the five historical songs. There are about four other psalms that are basically historical. Now, the history in this particular psalm begins with the Exodus. We remember the story of the Exodus in the Old Testament and ends with the division of the kingdom under Solomon. So the writer of this psalm urges his hearers to take heed to the warning of Israel's sins. His emphasis was, if you don't take to heart the lessons learned from history, then you are doomed to what? Repeat those blunders. Now, by the way, in the last, uh, last few years, there have been an effort on the part of some in our country to belittle our historical markers. What do you think about that? It's terrible. And why? We repeat it if you don't know about it. Exactly. History, I mean, just gives us the realities of the past. Good and bad, right? We've, we've had chapters in our history that's not good. But you, you're not responsible for it. And, and so, you know, it, it, we have some that would like for us to tear down all of the, the 
relics of the past that remind us of history. The very idea that we would do a thing like that. I don't know, I guess the fact that they stand reminds them of an ugly time and maybe in some way they're connected with it. But I, I want to read you a I want to read you a statement from Winston Churchill. You all remember him. Here's, here's a quotation. A nation that forgets its past has no future. Understanding that learning about your history is not about making any one person or people group feel guilty. You cannot be guilty of actions that took place before you were born. A lot of the statutes and say things reminds people of slavery. That was an ugly chapter. Uh, but that's past. Hopefully we've learned from that. Still a lot of slavery in our world, is it not? Of various kinds. A lot of slavery still in our world. But, you know, it's very important that we learn the lessons of history. So, I want us to look into this psalm here to, this afternoon and sort of an analysis. I'd like for somebody to read the first four verses. Give the ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in their parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Okay, what a good introduction. <laughs> Give ear. One translation says, incline your ear. As if to say, now listen, listen, I'm going to tell you about some history that we need to know and understand. Incline your ear to the things we've heard and known. Our fathers told us. Good, it's a good thing, you know, for fathers to tell the children about some history of the family. You know, family reunions aren't done much anymore. I remember growing up when family reunions were very, very popular. We had one every year. It was good for us. The children learned who their cousins were. Now my children don't even know their cousins. Because we live, you know, various parts of the country. We don't get together very often. I might have mentioned to you that I'm sponsoring one this summer, well, June, the last Saturday, at my house, my, my wife's family. Some live in Dixon, in west of Nashville. Some live at Maryville, Knoxville. I've all invited them to come. I might have to call on some of you for some food. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they're, they're, they're coming to our place and we're going to enjoy sort of getting reacquainted. Haven't seen some of them in years. You know, when the patriarch and the matriarch of the family died some years ago, you know, we used to go there all the time and visit with them and all would come for Christmas. Now, that's, that's more difficult nowadays. We're just scattered all over the place. And, uh, Getting together is a, is a real challenge. But note here, the, the fathers have taught us and they've told us. That day, you know, they didn't have some of the means we have today of passing information down. And so it was up to the fathers to teach the children, to tell them. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, uh, Moses, in talking about some of the practices of that time, said the day will come 
Well, your children will ask, what's this all about? What does this mean? And then you tell them. That's why they were to keep the Passover. What did the Passover commemorate? That's right. When they came out of Egypt, God spared his people, and the Egyptians were, uh, you know, confiscated and, uh, and frustrated, and, and yet God preserved his people. And uh, the Paschal lamb that was offered, and the blood on their doorpost and lentils, and when the angel of death passed through the land, those under the blood were spared. And so it's interesting in the New Testament, Christ is called our Passover because it's the blood of Christ that is given for the atonement for our sins. Okay, let's go on here. Look at a few other things. I will open my mouth in a parable. Who was it that taught so often in parables? Jesus. Jesus. How would you define a parable? familiar story or using something that they know about to make a point? Exactly. Exactly. Sometimes parable and a proverb are used interchangeably. A proverb is a, 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 a saying uh, in which something is really expressed very well. I believe uh, uh, early you'll remember you and Wilma that we had a study over at Willa on the proverb. I thought it was a very good study. We did that for about, I think, six weeks, six months or so. But a proverb and a parable are sometimes used interchangeably. I will utter dark sayings of old. It's talking about things that happened a long time ago here, which we've heard and known and our fathers have told us. Will not hide them from our children. One thing I've noticed in this, in this psalm is the importance of teaching your children. Telling your children about things. That's so very important spiritually uh, in the church. You know, the church has our kids only a few hours in a whole week. But parents have them for all, all the time, you know, just about. Except when they're public. <coughs> and so the duty is for parents to teach their children. In fact, that's what God said back in Deuteronomy 6. You know, teach them when you sit in the house, when you go along your daily activity. In other words, find teaching moments where you can teach your children. Be creative in it. Be consistent in it. And uh, let these words of mine first be in you. He's talking to the parents. And then you teach them diligently to your children that they may know and then teach their children, that is, your grandchildren. What were some of the things they were to teach the kids? Teach your children what? What were some of the things? All right, my commandments. The deeds of the Lord. The deeds of the Lord. The good things he's done for his people, yes. His mighty works. You know, we had a song here a few weeks ago, only God doeth wondrous things and all the things he done for his people. To have confidence in God, not to forget his works, to keep his word. All of these things were to be taught. Now, somebody read uh, verses, uh, let's see here. Let's through five through eight. Five through eight, somebody. For he established the testimony of Jacob, the appointing of Law and Israel, which he commanded their fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generations to come might know them, the children who bear, who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. May not be like they may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright, and 
to the spirit that's not faithful to God. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, that's a marvelous paragraph right there. Is the, the things that were to be taught, things that the children were to be reminded of, and uh, that they might set their hope in God, not forget his works, keep his word, not to be like their fathers who were rebellious and stubborn, and to set their hearts and spirit faithfully to serve God. Now you think about those principles. Aren't those same principles relevant today? Th think about it. These principles are just as important today as ever, aren't they? You know, set your hope in God. Hope is not in government. Hope is not in man. It's in God. Don't forget his works. And uh, not to be rebellious and stubborn as a generation. That our hearts and our spirit might be right. Now, Ephraim is a good example of someone forgetting about all of these things. Ephraim. Let's see. Let's read somebody 9 through 11. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Question, who was Ephraim? He was the younger of Joseph's two sons. Yes. What is What distinguishes Ephraim when they made inheritance of the land and they received their land? What stands out about Ephraim? It was the largest territory the largest territory, that this half tribe uh, to the north, Ephraim, was the largest and often used, like in Hosea and Amos, the largest tribe was often used to include the whole of Israel. That is, when Hosea was addressing the whole of the ten tribes, he used the largest tribe to describe the whole of it. But uh, it's, it's interesting they did not keep the covenant. They refused to walk in the law of God. They forgot his deeds and the great miracles he had performed in bringing the people to the land. So here's an example as to why it was important to teach the children about all these great things God had done and not to forget God's goodness to the people. Well, uh, in verses 12 through 16, uh, we're going to read about God's faithfulness to his people all during this. Read it, somebody. What, let's see, 12 through 16. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zon. He divided the sea and let them pass through it, and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Marvelous things. Sometimes called wondrous things that God did in the sight of all of our fathers. And yet, in spite of all those things, they rebelled against him. He mentioned specifically here about five of those marvelous things that Elijah read to us about that God did to sustain his people there during the exodus on their way to the promised land. First thing, he divided the Red Sea and he prepared the seabed for ease of passage. You know, when, when God did this wonderful miracle, this amazing thing, a lot of unbelievers today read this in the Bible and they say, nonsense, that never happened, that's just of somebody's imagination. God opened up that sea, though, and held the waters back in a heap, he said, and prepared even the seabed 
where they went through, not in mud, to mire up in the mud and the sand, but on dry land. God prepared even the seabed for them to pass through. What a miracle. What an amazing thing. Then he led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of what by night? Fire. And uh, you know, that's that's recorded in the story of, in the book of Numbers and Exodus. Then when they got out there in the wilderness, he provided abundant water in the arid desert by the miracle of splitting or cleaving the rocks and the water would come forth. I can tell you by traveling through the wilderness myself, it's a dry place. I mean, just every now and then you would come to an oasis and you would see a few green trees. That was an indication of water. But very seldom. That wilderness, that desert place, so forlorn. This is the area in which he brought them through. Now think about this. They wandered in there. How, how long? Forty years altogether. I've often thought about that, you know. How, how, I can live, I can understand a little bit why they complain. We have it made, and we still complain. Don't we? I might have complained a while ago because my garden's dry. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, if anybody ever had a right to complain, however, God supplied their needs. And it mentions made here, he, he provided the water, we came to the place called Myra or Myra. <coughs> That's the place where, you know, they couldn't drink the water because it was bitter. There was water there. God told Moses, cut down this tree and let it fall into the water. And he did. And the water was sweet. Then he rained manna down from the skies. So they had, it said, food to the full. In other words, they had plenty to eat of the manna. But they didn't like that wafer. You know, they got tired of those <coughs> vanilla wafers. Something, something like that, most people think. So he showered them with what? Quail. Quail. That's pretty good eating, isn't it? And for, because of their desire for me. In other words, God gave them, as we sometimes say, showers of blessings. Showers of blessings. But in spite of those blessings, they rebelled against God, verse 17. They tested him, verse 18. They doubted him, verses 19 and 20. They did not believe, verse 22. They grieved and provoked the Lord. Well, my, my. What examples we have here. Yet, they sin. All right, let's see where we are. Um, uh, read 34 and 30 through 39, somebody. When he slew them, then they saw him, and they returned and sought the other faithful God. Then they remembered that God was their rock, most high God their Redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth, and they lied to them with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, but he being great, but he, being full of compassion, forgave them, forgave their iniquity, and did not destroy them. Yet many a time he turned them, turned his anger away, and did not stir up all his wrath. For well, he remembered that they were 
the flesh that dreads it passed away does not come again. And you remembered that they were but flesh. And this is, you read this and you, you get the impression our God is so patient. He's so long suffering. He puts up with a lot. He did with these people. And are we any different? No, we're not even the same. Still have that same problem, don't we? They weren't faithful to the covenant. Yet, but he being full of compassion, being full of compassion. You know, we see the goodness and the severity of God. He slew several in the wilderness. Do you recall when the golden calf was made? Do you recall when they came, I guess it was, to the Mo to Moab and, and the people, it says, that they committed a, a fornication with the girls of that area? And God slew 24,000. So the mention is made here, uh, when he slew them, then they saw him. Not the one slain, but those who were living. Seeing God's dealing with it, they were moved to do something about it. So they turned to him. They cried out for his mercy. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. All right. Let's see here. That's quite a reading right here. Rebellion in the wilderness. Uh, so many occasions when they did this. Mention is made, by, by the way, here of the uh, times that God uh, sent the plagues upon the people and all of that before he brought them out. But it ultimately, he brought them to his holy land. Holy land. You know, Israel is still called by most people the holy land. When you go to Israel, you often, it's often described as a visit to the holy land. Well, let me ask you something. Is that land still holy? It's just a land, isn't it? I mean, now God has a holy people, and it's his redeemed. I, I don't believe it's any particular nation, physically. But God has a spiritual people. He has a special people. <coughs> and it's people of every tongue and kindred and race and nation who are his atonement ones, who have come by way of the cross. Those who are obedient to him. Those who love him and serve him. Peter called them this holy nation. 2 Peter 2 and verse 9. All right, let's see. The Lord preserved Judah. Now, you know that the kingdom was divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Judah. God preserved Judah. After Israel was taken by the Assyrians into captivity and scattered over the world, God preserved the promise through Judah. By the way, that goes back to the book of Genesis, where in chapter 49, at verse 10, God said the scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Now who's Shiloh there? Jesus. Exactly. The word Shiloh means one who would exercise peace and authority. Jesus. So there's the promise of Christ coming through the tribe of Judah. And of course in the book of Hebrews it's clear he came of the tribe of Judah. Not the tribe of Aaron, the priestly tribe tribe of Judah. So here you have the preservation of Judah. 
in order to keep in intact God's promise. It seemed that the people were just bent on destroying God's promise. But what God promises, he also performs. Now let's get to application time. We So quickly our time runs out, it seems. a uh, poetic uh, expression that sometimes when God awakens to what he had promised. You know, he remembered what he had promised. One psalm says God never slumbers nor sleeps. Mm -hmm. Psalm 90. So it's not a contradiction here. It's, it's poetic license. You know, when something is expressed and is used in terms of human, human terms. Yeah. All right. All right. I think, and when we think of application, it's, it, this whole psalm is like a, a history teacher. Here stands an old man looking back in history, exhorting the oncoming generation with the fire of a prophet. It speaks of a lot of things here. When I think of application today, I think of our home front mission. We have a home front mission. That is the home, the family. See that in this song. You know, charity begins at home. And so does Christianity. Christianity begins at home. The best mission field in the world is our children. If we save our children, we're doing rather well. And then, of course, we reach out to the world, of course, but we need to begin at home, don't we? And it hurts us deeply when a child does not believe or a child does not follow our example, it happens in all of our families. It happens. And it touches us deeply. You know, we've been commissioned to evangelize the world, but we're also told to lead our families for God. And this psalm, the writer challenges us concerning our children. He says, we have no right to live for ourselves and ourselves alone. We're connected to our past, and we're connected to our future through our children. Then he says, we've received a command from God regarding our children. Our children are so important. He says, we're to tell our children of the past. He says, we're not only to teach our children, but teach them to teach their children. In other words, our grandchildren. The psalmist calls his people to an examination of their spiritual life. Very much like Paul who said one time, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. So he calls upon us to do that very thing. To look back. Sometimes it's good for us to look back. We don't want to stay in the, in the past. But it's good to look back at the past. Learn from our blunders and be inspired by the good things that we've had in our past. See our spiritual history. The past can give us guidance, direction, if we we'll learn the lessons that it provides. Then we are to look at ourselves. This psalm tells us, look at yourself. Are we making progress? Are we still making the same old blunders they made? And then it tells us, look forward. Resolve that we will put our trust and our confidence in God. That we will faithfully follow his word. Now, here are some of the, of the, of the real blunders and mistakes of Israel's history. One is forgetfulness. They didn't remember. The key to the book of Deuteronomy, as I said, is remember 
Do not forget. Another thing is ingratitude. They fail to be thankful. That's one of our blunders. Lack of gratitude for our blessings. Uh, idolatry. You know, they cease to be thankful to God, and when they did, it seems they turned to dumb idols. Things made of wood and stone and all of that. Fascination for the gods of their neighbors led them astray. Got a question. Are we guilty? Is it possible to be guilty of idolatry today? Yes. 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 What are our idols? Money. Money. Money? Football. What? Football. Okay. 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 <laughs> What else? Sometimes grandchildren. So, okay. 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 Television. Television. Cell phones. Phone. Cell phones. You know, if we give just one tenth of the time to our Bible that we do our cell phone, it'd make a big difference, would it? Don't you know, hey, I talk to people, they can't get their minds on or hands off the cell phone? In my defense, okay. my Bible is in here. <laughs> oh, okay. Got your Bible there. Okay. Well, I know a lot of people do that. Yeah. They, they just hold up their cell phone, got their Bibles on. All right. They, they failed to remember. They were forgetful idolatry. Now I'm going to close with... Using Psalm 78, let's, let's just think of it as a sermon in which the author or the preacher, Asaph, is using history to call his people to revival and to recommitment to the Lord. His approach raises this question, and that is, what should we do with a sermon? Uh, he's got a sermon here for us. What should you do with a sermon? First, first, what? Deliver it. Huh? Deliver it. All right. Well, yeah, the preacher's got to deliver it. And you've got to what? Listen. Listen. Listen to it. Listening will open the door of the mind. And that provides an entrance for the message. I, know, I think a lot of people can look you straight in the eye when you preach and go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe prepare the meal for the day. But we've got to listen. Listen, first thing. And then, you listen and take it to heart. Yes. Ponder the message. Ponder it. What do you do when you ponder something? Think about it. You yeah. think about it. Concentrate on it. Meditate on it. Digest it to understand it. And then, number three, is the, perhaps the most difficult thing. Apply it. Act on it. That's right. Act upon it. James said, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. We can hear it with no intention of trying to find a way to apply it. You know, if we'll listen with the view to application, how can I use this? Maybe there's just one part of it that really stands out to you. And you say, I'm going to try to find some way to use this this week. Say, if it's only encouragement, I want to find somebody this week that's down in the dumps that I can lift. Call them on the phone, send a little note in the mail. I got a note in the mail from one of our elders last week and I had to tell him it meant so much to me. You'll never know just how much that meant to me. A note from somebody just has a way of really touching their heart. You take the time to sit down with your pen 
and you write a note to somebody. They open up it, they open it up and look at it and read it. Her name is at the bottom. It just means a whole lot. Telephone call. Maybe some little action you could do, like taking a plate of food or something to somebody that might need it. Just a lot of ways to apply what we learn. And the best application I know of this is stay alert. Keep your 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 life on track. And when it begins to veer off, like Paul would say, bring to captivity your thoughts and get back in line. And, and that takes a good bit of will, willpower. And may God bless us to do all that. Thank you for being with us today. Next week is some what? 81. Huh? 81. 81. It, it, it's, it's the one that says only if you would listen. <laughs> only if you would listen. If my people would only listen. That's a God saying to his people, if you would only listen. It'd be like a father saying to his kid, you know, listen to me. All right. Thank you for being with us today. How many do we have? Mr. Roy's camp right now. Good. Fifty-two. Fifty-two. Uh, That's good. That's good. One more session. We'll break for the song. Let's have a closing prayer. Uh, Brother, lead us in a closing day. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for another precious day of life with so many blessings that you continue to give us. We just thank you so much for Clarence and his ability to uh, explain the word. And we thank you, Lord, for the ability to come back to your house and hear and discuss another portion of it. Lord, as we depart today, I just pray that you will lead, guide, and direct us in all that we do. Keep us safe and in your uh, in your mind, dear Lord. For it's in your holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.